This is Texans TV. Pharaoh Brown takes us through his My Football story. And we show episode two of Puro Texans. Texans 360 starts now. We are ready to rock. It is rock and roll. Hey, greatness today, man. Touchdown, Texans. Guess when you think you've seen it all. There's always something else. They want that content, we gon' get it to them. Welcome into Texans 360. So glad you could join us because we've got another great show for you the way we always do. We love catching up with players and their social media. And we find out more about Charlie Heck and his Instagram. Also, my football story with Farrell Brown. But first, I got to catch up with a player the way I always do in the deep slant. And this week, it was rookie Nico Collins. He's back off IR. He's doing great things when he is out there on the field. We caught up with his rookie year and him and how it's all going. Take a look. It's the Deep Slant 101 presented by Xfinity. My guest, rookie wide receiver Nico Collins. Nico, I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet. So first of all, welcome back to the field. I'm sure it feels good to be back out there man. playing. Uh, it feels great, man. Just to be out there with my teammates competing on Sunday, man. Just getting that feeling again. Yeah, David Culley said that you added a little bit of a spark in your first game back. So, you know, obviously you don't want to be on IR your rookie yeah. year, but you were and you're already off again. So what were those What were those three weeks like for you? Pretty rough. I got hurt, Cleveland game, first play, man. You know, that I feel like that, that really set me back. Every day it was kind of a mental thing, mentally locked in in the meeting rooms, even during practice, you know, even though I'm not getting to the physical reps, you know, I had to lock in mentally, you know, act like I'm really getting the game reps. So, it was, it was more a mental thing for me, but I feel like I did a pretty good job doing that, you know, making sure I was staying engaged, making sure I'm not getting behind on plays or new formation or anything. Coach Kelly put in. I feel like I, I did pretty good, you know, being on IR. You know, I hope that I'm not back on that thing no more because it was devastating. No, but nobody wants to see you <laughs> back on there again. Tim yeah. Kelly actually said that you looked like you hadn't missed a beat. And when you made that catch at Cleveland, Tyrod Taylor was the starting quarterback, and you come back in and it's Davis Mills. So. Yes. You haven't missed a beat. The quarterback's changed. You know, what has that transition been like for you? I feel like when I went in, we had the connection because we get those reps during camp and, you know, OTAs, just every day during practice. You know, routes on there, you know, with they switch doing quarterbacks, rotation, you know, so it really don't matter who I go with. We all getting the timing right on the routes I have. So just things like that. Yeah, it did seem like in yeah. training camp, you guys had a great <laughs> chemistry going, you and Definitely. Davis. All right, so Brandon Cooks had been asked about you quite a bit during training camp in this uh -huh. offseason, and he said, that you did not look like a rookie to him. He said he may be a rookie, but he doesn't look like a rookie to me. So uh, what sort of steady are you? Are you like one that watches a lot of film? Are you the type that you get out there once and you do it and you get it right? What, what is your preparation? What's your process like? What made it so easy for you to make that transition this um, off season? The best way I learned is actually going out there and physically doing it. For example, say we put in a new install, you know, I see it, write it down. And then the best way I understand is going out there, hearing it and going get lined up and actually going through the the footstep, the footwear, and the time with the quarterbacks. All right, so you went to Michigan, but you're from Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama yes, ma'am. And I was reading that uh, Nick Saban actually offered you a scholarship as a sophomore in high school. Yes, ma'am. How did that go? So he just showed up at your high school and offered you a scholarship yeah, so, to Alabama? No, this is what happened. I got an offer from Southern Miss that day. I still remember. So I got an offer from Southern Miss. You're a sophomore in high school? Sophomore in high school, okay. yes, ma'am. So I was, it was last period, and I was working out. And so my coach, head coach, um, Coach Hood, he um, called me to the office. And he said, uh, Nick Saban on the phone. You know, I was happy, you know, being a sophomore in high school, he's like, wow, you know, Saban want to talk to me. And so I went to his office, you know, I talked to him, um, and he wanted me to come up on, on a visit that weekend. Just so I could see campus, you know, see how it is there, you know. So um, that weekend, I went there, and then he ended up offering me a scholarship, you know, in his office, you know. So that one, that I'm blessed for that one. Being so young in, in 10th grade, you know, that was my about to be my first year on varsity and he offered me a scholarship you know it's just amazing because not many people get the opportunity you know so it was a blessing for sure and then that next day Auburn offered me so it was kind of like a rivalry uh -huh, sure you know it was like oh Bama off no I really got to offer him too all right what about for the rest of the year because you never know what's going to happen at the quarterback situation you got Tyrod you got Davis and and what are some things that you want to get better at you've got some games um, still ahead of you everything I just want to get better just understanding the offense understanding the coverages working on my game. There's always room for improvement. I just feel like those things I really want to work on and focus on. But overall, just become a better player. You know, I just want to be there for my teammates, man, um, and just show up on Sundays and make plays for my team. 
All right. We're looking forward to seeing it, Nico. Thank Thanks so much. much for the time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And the Texans are getting geared up to play at Arizona, the second of their road trip. It's going to be the Cardinals. It's a tough matchup. They're 6-0. I had a chance to catch up with Danny Sarek, Arizona Cardinals team reporter, and find out more about what this Cardinals team is all about. It's Enemy Sidelines presented by Microsoft. My guest this week, Danny Sarek. She's a team reporter for the Arizona Cardinals. Danny, I normally ask uh, of reporters about their team, but it seems like there's a lot of familiarity with this Cardinals team and the Texans. So we'll get to that in a bit. But first of all, sitting at 6-0, and the only undefeated team in the NFL. Uh, this team seems pretty talented in all phases. Does this Cardinals team have any weaknesses? If we were going into this last week's game against the Browns, it would have been really easy to say it's the run defense. But of all weeks for this Cardinals defense to figure it out, it was this past week against the Browns who had the number one rushing team in the league and they held them to just 73 rushing yards. So it seems like on both sides of the ball, this Cardinals team has really found a way to be cohesive and they've done so with injuries and adversity, not only with players, but with coaches as well who weren't on the sideline. So there aren't any blaring you know, concerns on this team right now. And I think that's what makes them so scary is there's not necessarily one easy part about this team for opponents to pinpoint to attack. What are they making of this Texans team coming out to face um, them at home? Obviously the record is not where they the Texans want it to be, but 6-0 and team facing the Texans who um, have only won one game this year. How are they sort of viewing this matchup? I think it just goes back to the last question about this being really tough mentally of any team. It doesn't matter what the record is, the team you're facing. Anything can happen in the NFL. Every player, every team is a good team at this point in their career. So it's about staying mentally focused. And again, not comparing the fact you're going into a game as an undefeated Cardinals team going up against a one in five Texans team that's been struggling. You know, the Cardinals are not going to want to play down to anyone by any means. Uh, they're just going to want to stay focused and, and just try and get this win and then move on to Green Bay. It's going to be a, a very quick week here in Arizona. All right. Well, familiar faces on Sunday and uh, it'll be interesting to see first time for J.J. Watt and DeAndre Hopkins facing the Texans and the Texans facing them. Danny, thank you so much for the time and we look forward to chatting soon. Thanks. We do a deep dive on Charlie Heck's Instagram. That's next on Texans 360. Welcome back to the Ford Studio, and we love catching up with our players and their stories. Farrell Brown has had a great story growing up playing not tight end, but defense when he was a kid. And then he went to Oregon, had such a serious injury. And then he bounced around to several different teams before he finally landed here with the Houston Texans. It's a great story, and we'll let him tell you himself. It's Farrell Brown with My Football Story. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. My childhood was fun. I have nothing but good memories. Me and my sister I grew up in a single mother home. When I was like six or seven, my sister was cheerleading for a Pop Warner team. And I went to a practice and seen all the kids out there playing. So I told my mom I wanted to get on the team, but I was too young. So I cried for like two days. I just kind of kept going out there. And then they let me just practice with them. And that's kind of how I got into football. I went to high school at Brush High School. Football there was kind of rough. It was like 0 and 11. They didn't win a game in like two or three years. I didn't play football until my junior year. I just played basketball. And then one of the coaches, Coach Houchins, we had a heart-to-heart a -heart conversation and he got me to come play football. First I was playing defensive end and Oregon wanted me as an offensive player, as a tight end, but I've never had played it. So going into my senior year, I was like, okay, I'm going to play offense this year. And you just kind of get more girls scoring touchdowns than sacks in high school. A lot of coaches that I trust in high school, they always told me you have the chance to make it if you just put in the work and stay on this right path. So I just kind of took their words in it that those people believed in me. And so I kind of switched over and then went to Oregon. Mariota firing into the end zone. Touchdown Ducks, Farrell Brown with the catch. Eugene is an awesome place, like God's country out there. Eugene gets pretty wild during the football season. So, I mean, I have nothing but great memories. We was ranked top five every year I was there. So, you just kind of being good, winning. I mean, it was just fun. 
had good college years, but I had an injury that really scared a lot of teams. Earl Brown remains hospitalized in Salt Lake City after suffering leg injury. That process was pretty rough, almost losing my leg, having to reteach myself how to walk again. You know, that I did 20 months of rehab and I couldn't even walk up a staircase. I couldn't even step in the shower. My way of doing everything in life is just keeping my head down and working. And through all my trials and tribulations, that method of thinking has worked out to this point. And that's just what I did. I was the only person ever in football that had this injury. You know, they never seen it before. I wrote, I wrote the blueprint to it. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to anybody else. It's kind of an uphill battle when you come in and draft it. It's different things that you got to deal with that a, a draft pick wouldn't. And you're treated differently than a draft pick is. You just gotta put your head down and work. I was with Oakland at first, and then I was on the streets uh, looking for a team for like three, four weeks. And my agent had called me, and he had a few different teams, but he was like, you're not gonna believe who I was just talking to. And he was like, it was Cleveland. And I was like, I don't gotta hear no more, just sign me up. Being home was a dream come true. Just being a Browns fan and seeing the change from when I was growing up and coming up to their recent success is just, it was great to see. I had a few visits set up because I was a release. I chose to come here first just because the depth at my position was pretty slim. And when I got down here, I did a workout. They liked me. And Bill said that he was going to put me on the roster because a few other teams, like the Browns, wanted me to be on the practice squad. And I knew I would be able to come here and get a fair shot and be able to just compete. And that's what I did. I came here, competed, and my playing time increased. Pressure arriving, throws it, caught at the 10 and dragged down at the 5. Farrell Brown, first and goal, Houston. I never take a day for granted. Going through what I've been through after the injuries, the little things that matter that get taken away from you that make you realize. So every time I'm out here, I'm just giving my all because you never know when your time will be up. And uh, that's just stuff that I, that I take with me on the football field and in life. So I'm just grateful, blessed. Uh, happy to be able to be, continue to play in the game that I love and just happy to keep beating the odds. What a great story by Farrell Brown. And uh, we also caught up with Charlie Heck, right tackle for the Houston Texans. He's getting starts now. Found out a little bit more about him through his social media. All right, Charlie, you've got the mustache and... You proclaimed on Instagram, it's Instagram mm -hmm. official, you and the mustache are not breaking up. You guys are still together. It's back right now. Mm -hmm. So the mustache began, I mean, we've only known you really with a mustache mm -hmm. and a so, mask. Yeah, exactly. So it started as kind of a rookie thing. I showed up with like the resemblance of a little mustache and one of the older veterans said, you know what, you're keeping the stash the rest <laughs> of the year. And first I didn't really like it. My mom definitely didn't like it, but it kind of grew on me at the end of the season. And after the season, I had a decision to make and I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna keep it going. <laughs> I think it's a great conversation starter, mm -hmm. right? Do people come up to you and just ask you about, they must ask you, you questions you, you'd and You'd be all. surprised yeah. how much of a topic it really is. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that another bonus for having a mustache, keeping it? See, I don't know. La last year I had the mask kind of hiding it a yes. bunch. So, I mean, there are some unwanted opinions about <laughs> it, but um, <laughs> it's been fine. All right, if you get rid of the stash, mm -hmm. would you go something equally different? Like just maybe a chin beard mm -hmm. or maybe just, you know, like the, the mutton chops or anything like that? <laughs> no, I think it would just be clean shaven. You would just go clean yeah. shaven. Yeah, you're like mustache or nothing. Yep, exactly. Mustache or bust. Mm -hmm. All right, good stuff. Okay, this picture, first spring ball in the books. That mm -hmm. has got to be a great memory. It's you and your brother. You guys used to play college ball together. Yep. All right, so how, what was that like getting it, get to play at that level with your brother? That was awesome. I mean, that was one of the big reasons I chose to go to North Carolina, because my brother was playing there. So we overlapped for two seasons there. I mean, that was really special. I mean, because growing up, he was always older. I didn't get to spend too much time with him, but then, when we became teammates in college, we really got closer to his brothers. So that was really special for me. So remind me, does your brother play offensive line as well? Yep, so he was a tackle okay. also. So I was his backup the first two years. Then he graduated and uh, so I just took his spot. So I'm sure some fans just think there's a heck that's been playing at UNC <laughs> for, they just think he hasn't graduated at all. They're like, <laughs> oh, wait, I thought his name was, mm -hmm. I guess I got his name wrong. His name yeah. is Charlie. Mm -hmm. What was it like being in meeting rooms and in the locker room? Because teammates are so close as it is, but to have an actual, your actual mm -hmm. blood brother in the locker room must have been pretty cool. Yeah, it was really cool. That was really special for me and it was special for him. Like I said, because 
I mean, teammates, you become so close with everybody. So, and then having that he's my actual brother, he was there to look out for me whenever I had a question. He realized his passion was in strength and conditioning. So uh, he's a strength coach at UNC right now, actually. So once he graduated, then he actually, his last, my last two years, he was one of my coaches. Um, so, because he was a strength coach. <laughs> do you like your brother better as a teammate or as a coach? What Probably as a teammate. Really? <laughs> yeah. Was he pretty tough as a strength and conditioning coach? He could be. He was, he was mainly working with the freshmen, so, um, but he knows his stuff, so I, I wanted to work with him. And you've got a strength and conditioning coach in the off season. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Coming up, it's time for Pro Texans. That's next on Texans 360. If you could only eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would you choose? Lord have mercy. That's a tough one. One meal for the rest of life, it'd probably have to be surf and turf. Ain't nothing better than a great Wagyu steak with a beautiful South African lobster tail. Fried, broiled, grilled, however you like it, but you can't lose with the surf and turf. Dream vacation location. It would have to be right now, it'd have to be somewhere in Asia. I haven't been to Asia yet. So it would have to be somewhere in Asia. Don't know where exactly, but somewhere in Asia. Who has the best fits on the team? Other than myself? Me, of course. Can't put anybody ahead of me. Mark Ingram, the second. Best fits on the team. Stay tuned. Who has the best shoe game on the team? Mark Ingram the second. How can I? I'm a shoe head, a sneaker head, in the worst, best type of way. So I had to say myself again, Mark Ingram the second. Although there's many others with great shoe game, none better than myself. Stay tuned. Texans 360 rolls on, and so does Pro Texans. We're in a brand new season. It's episode two. Houston Texans cheerleader Rose takes us behind the scenes. Hola Texans fans, my name is Rose and I am your host for Puro Texans. We are at the NRG Stadium today to meet our friends, the Somos Texans Mexico fan club, all the way from Mexico City. Because Mexico has our biggest fan base outside of the US and accounts for more than 50% of American NFL fans, we are so excited to have them here today. So let's head over to Armando and his friends so we could talk a little bit more about their love for Texans football. Hola Armando, ¿cómo estás? Bienvenido a Houston. How was your trip from Mexico City? It was a good trip. Every, every time that we are able to come to Houston with some friends and some fans, it's, it's really encouraging to be here. Yes, and we're so excited to have you. You are the founder of the Somos Texans Mexico Fan Club. Can you tell us a little bit about you, why you started it, and how it has evolved? I became a Houston Texans fan in 2001. I was like 12 or 13 years old at that time. And I was just uh, on the website of the NFL, and then I saw a new logo. And since then, I, see, I saw the logo, the color, the city, and I was like, wow, this is my team. From now on, and until I die, I will be a Texan fan. I love that. You fell in love. It was love at first sight. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the group started in 2017. After the Texans came to Mexico in 2016, we, we were like, hey, we know that we have the traveling Texans that are in Mexico, but we saw more Texans fans from Mexico. So we decided like, hey, we know that there are more fans, we need to try to find them. And then we have to create a group to support the team. We have our, our annual picture, we have our parties, a lot of fiesta. As you can imagine, every game we make a big fiesta just to support the Houston Texans. We have uh, like a 150 active members in Mexico. Wow. Unfortunately, they are not able to come, but we're very happy that uh, we have more fans growing and growing, and I'm very happy to be here with them. So thank you guys so much for being here and talking to us about the Somos Texans Mexico Fan Club. We hope you enjoy your stay here in Houston and that you enjoy thank the you. game. Yeah. And remember, as always, helping the Houston Texans Foundation. That's next on Texans 360. A portion of this broadcast is sponsored by Cigna. Together all the way.
back with one final segment of Texans 360, and the Texans are always out and about in the community doing great things. One cause very important to everyone at the organization, the Houston Texans Foundation. And there was a big event this week that raised a lot of money and awareness. Check it out. We couldn't be more thrilled to be back out here at the 12th annual Gridiron Legends Golf Tournament, beautiful Champions Golf Club for a sold out event as we recognize the incredible contributions of uh, so many of our great former players that make up our Gridiron Legends and also do it to benefit a wonderful charity in Depelchin Children's Center. So proud to be able to work with the Houston Texans Foundation to put on today's event. We all know how important philanthropy is to our organization. It's in the fiber of, of our DNA and really today's event, just another extension of how we're able to do great things for Houston and uh, bring together football at all levels. We cannot do the programs that we do without the support from our community. DePelton is 129 years old and we want to be here for a long, long time and we do that because of our community. We continue to reap the benefits of all the great support that the DePelton receives from the Texas Bowl. It's not only the money and the donations that we receive, but it's exceptional experiences for our children and our families who get to go to games, who get to go to some of the other experiences that the Texas Bowl provides. So we are just exceptionally grateful and so happy to be a part and a partner with the Texas Bowl. That's gonna do it for another episode of Texans 360, and we love bringing you some great content every single week. If you see something that you like and you wanna watch it again or watch other things, you can go to HoustonTexans.com. We've got all that and more. But that's gonna do it for our episode. A special thanks to Tyler Sudarth, who works so hard on this show, and to all of you watching. Thank you so much, and as always, go Texans. Thanks for watching and go Texans! Like, subscribe, and ring the bell for new content.